भाई सहन से तोड़ा नहीं है So welcome to the second session, which uh, is again about uh, local ecosystems for inclusive innovation. Now I think, uh, you know, if I just want to start this session, I would like to basically talk about what is innovation? And I think all of us can agree that innovation is about taking ideas to the market. And if you then talk about inclusive innovation, it's basically about including every strata of society in this process of taking ideas to the market. Um, so, you know, what is it that this inclusive innovation model needs? I think everyone has been talking about the need for human capital, for skills, uh, you know, for how to synergistically connect various types of skills in an ecosystem. How do you fund these ideas? Uh, do you fund them up to prototype? Do you fund them up to proof of concept? Do you fund them right up to commercialization? I think these are some of the questions we need to ask ourselves. This morning you heard a very interesting comment from Israel saying that in Israel, it's really about just funding a, a huge uh, plethora of uh, startups and then just letting those startups get to a point and then let someone else scale it up. So I think that was a very, very interesting approach to innovation, saying just let, let's fund ideas, just let's fund a whole bunch of ideas and let those ideas then go up to a scale or a you know, proof of concept and then let that be funded later on by a commercial venture system. And then of course, uh, you know, underlying this is various types of support, largely what we refer to as research and development or simply development. And uh, I think this research and development is really required for continual improvement and, and scaling and what have you. And I think in many parts of the world, when you talk about uh, inclusive innovation, there is also an underlying need or desire to address affordable innovation and deliver affordability at the end of it all so that it can benefit uh, 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 the whole uh, population base, even right up to the bottom of the pyramid. Now, there are various types of uh, you know, innovation ecosystems, and each ecosystem, I guess, needs a different kind of uh, needs. So you have the clusters, uh, which which require a, a you know a, a set of other connected needs, and then you have just individual entrepreneurs who may not need the same kind of synergistic connectivity that clusters have such as the startup models where you can just have a whole mushrooming of startups, but they need not all interconnect, but some of them might end up interconnecting to build scale. Um, you know, I think we've got a very, very interesting panel to discuss various aspects of this particular ecosystem. And I'd like to uh, start by asking um, uh, perhaps Samir Mitra, who basically has been working a lot with clusters. And I think he has been working with this whole cluster approach where he's trying to create an ecosystem that includes academia, the entrepreneur, and other, uh, you know, uh, industries that can actually support this particular innovation system. So maybe you should talk about uh, Two of them particularly, one is of course the Surat uh, cluster and the other is the Muradabad cluster. Um, I actually have a presentation also. If I could, uh, Kirti, if, uh, oh good, okay. 
So, uh, uh, you know, my name is Samir Mitra. I've, I've uh, been with the National Innovation Council team, and you know what I'm going to show you uh, today is really a, a whole bunch of work that uh, several people in this room have really contributed to. And um, uh, just to give you a little bit of a background about myself, I'm a I'm actually based in Silicon Valley. I've, I'm a software technology entrepreneur. Uh, turned uh, and decided that I need to help a broader population. Uh, and I uh, got a unique opportunity at the National Innovation Council to uh, do some unique work. And so I really f wanted to focus on driving innovation for the bottom of the pyramid, inclusive innovation. So uh, let's see. OK. Why doesn't this move? OK. So just to give you an idea about clusters in India, um, clusters, uh, India has about 5,000 industry clusters. Uh, to just give you a sense, this ranges from handicraft all the way to you know, high-tech uh, software, you know, automobile components. And uh, interestingly, most of these clusters uh, really represent um, the primary job creation engine because most of these clusters consist of small and medium-sized units, industries. Uh, more uniquely, most of these clusters really contain units and companies that are in the informal sector. That means they're actually not registered as companies. And they actually represent the primary job creation engine for India. Uh, and so how do you really drive innovation for these particular units that have no access to technology, financing, R&D, and, and how do you really drive this? And that was really the, the challenge that uh, uh, we took on to just see how can we drive uh, inclusive innovation. To give you a little idea, as Kiran mentioned, uh, there's a cluster in India called the Gems and Diamond uh, Cluster, which is in Surat, Gujarat. It's about a 600 square kilometer area that represents 12% of India's exports. Uh, so it's a huge cluster, although not an area, contains probably about 23,000 companies, uh, most of them in the informal sector. Um, and when you go investigate that particular cluster and you find out where is innovation happening in machine tooling and precision uh, you know, capabilities of cutting gems, uh, you go to the universities locally over there and the biggest uh, R&D projects in the universities are all related to leather. It has nothing to do with gems or diamonds. <laughs> Or, or anything related to that. It, it doesn't even impact the local industry. So it just gives you a sense of sort of the disconnect that exists locally. And uh, we really wanted to just demonstrate that innovation really needs to happen at a local level. And it is all about connecting, connecting, connecting. It's about connecting the different local assets that exist there, and then really having a common purpose to really drive innovation and create a collective to drive innovation rather than individually each company trying to do their own things. So we, we created this program and, and the idea was fundamentally let's take the pre-existing assets that exist at each local cluster. And these are enormous assets. These are knowledge, talent, uh, relationships, uh, huge amount of capabilities that exist in existing clusters. And let's not go create a new building. There's a lot of government programs say Let's go create a new building to drive innovation in this local cluster. We just said, let's take existing assets and leverage that. We then came up with a new idea. We said, in each cluster, there is an industry association that represents the inter interest of this cluster. Typically, associations mostly focus on lobbying efforts with government or state governments. So let's convert these industry associations to basically act as the shepherds for innovation end to end. So the association becomes a collective agency to drive innovation for each individual unit because each individual unit can't afford its own R&D, can't afford to attract talent to bring up with new products. But the industry cluster association could act as this collective agency locally to drive innovation end to end. So we created these local innovation, inclusive innovation ecosystems, both consisting of formal units and informal units, and really institutionalized what we call the cluster innovation uh, center in each industry association locally. And that is where we brought all the connectivity into R&D institutions, 
universities, and they acted on behalf of the entire cluster. Uh, and we also did this with local universities as well. So it was not just the industry associations, as Kiran mentioned, we also did it at the local universities. We created, again, CICs, these cluster innovation uh, centers. So just to give you an idea, this is uh, pilots in India. Uh, we did about seven pilots. Uh, these seven pilots connect collectively employed about a million people, had about 85,000 companies, and represent close to about four billion in revenue. Uh, and these are just seven clusters in India. So you can imagine the enormity of scale that we had to deal with. This is an example of Moradabad. Uh, this is a cluster in uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, which is the primary cluster for brassware. And brassware is exported. Uh, brassware articles, you know, these statues, various gift items, they're all exported from Moradabad. And the left-hand side really shows what the industry association had as an ecosystem and we created what is called a CIC there, which is a cluster innovation center, which we institutionalized on the right-hand side within that uh, Muradabad Cluster Industry Association. So just to give you an idea, we ran these pilots in uh, these uh, seven industry clusters, and in about 18 months, by driving the connectivity with the right R&D institutions, the universities, we had just enormous results, and in fact, uh, uh, we, you know, we've, we've published in the Global Innovation Index at the UN. We had the opportunity to present this uh, entire program because it was so interesting with Ban Ki Moon at, at, uh, at, at, uh, in Geneva in July of this year. And we have several uh, business case studies by the Indian School of Business. And I wanted to show you some results. So let me show you the result of Moradabad. So Moradabad uh, has one fundamental problem is if you can drive innovation to increase the income of, a, of an individual artisan, they immediately feel the benefits of innovation locally, and therefore they're going to believe in innovation. So we went into uh, Moradabad, and on the left-hand side is basically an artisan. There's about 300,000 of these artisans in Moradabad. Uh, they basically smelt brass in their hut with coal furnaces, and they basically get paid on a annual, on a daily basis, on the weight of how much brass they produce. And we, we looked at this furnace and we said that this furnace, number one, is polluting, it's uh, highly inefficient. So we had the real unique opportunity to work with Samir, Dr. Samir Brahmachari's lab, uh, on a metallurgy lab, where we redesigned the furnace for these uh, artisans in the huts. It cost basically 3,000 rupees, increased their throughput of brassware articles from a daily income of generating about 700 rupees, day, 700 rupees a day to 1,200 rupees a day. We increased their income by 70% with a 3,000 rupee coal furnace that was basically installed in their hut in less than three days. So as you can imagine for these artisans, they thought we were gods because we, we, in a matter of a few days, they suddenly generated a huge amount of income and plus the furnace was less polluting for their children and for their family. And this is the kind of local targeted innovation. It didn't, you know, this is a hut that has no electricity. It, 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 it just, there's, it's just bare bones. And we still could generate new income. And I think focus around inclusive innovation in my experience so far is if we can drive innovation to increase the income of all these workers, then you have a self-sustaining system where people believe in innovation and believe in new products and they ask for more. And so now that industry association is now making all different kinds of furnaces for different types of needs. So we don't have to do anything. And our net investment from a government perspective was basically two scientists in a metallurgy lab and two people from our National Innovation Council team working for a few months to kind of get this uh, new furnace done. So this is just an example of, of, of inclusive innovation at a local level that we drove. Another example is in Krishnagiri, which is the uh, mango growing hub of India. Basically, 60% of India's mangoes come from Krishnagiri in Tamil Nadu. And during their season, they produce a whole bunch of mango waste because they create pulp. And close to about 1.5 million tons of waste is, is created. They don't know what to do with it. And so we came up with sort of interesting technology that converted waste to fuel briquettes. And so we basically 
reduce their cost of producing uh, food processing, and yet recycle all of the waste into something really useful. And we did several of these kinds of small innovations in many, many different uh, parts, and I'll, I, I can just show you so many examples. But the point is that I think we, are, we, we figured out a mechanism of how to essentially utilize and create a distribution mechanism for innovation by really awakening the industry associations locally and then having them continuously invest and pool their money for future R&D to continue in driving things. Ultimately, we had to show examples, and the work from the government perspective is to make all of these folks believers in innovation and give them an example that we can increase their income and really then drive a self-sustaining mechanism locally to continue that. And that was uh, you know, our, our program. Thanks. Thanks, Amir. Maybe in that same line, I'd like to... Yeah. I'd like to continue in that same vein and ask uh, Kushal Chakravarti, who is the business development manager for carpets and rugs in Asia Pacific for IKEA, to basically talk about what they are doing in terms of uh, inclusive innovation, in terms of you know sourcing these kind of products. Thank you. Uh, I have a presentation. Uh, my name is Kushal and uh, I work in IKEA, uh, looking after the rugs and uh, carpet business in uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, IKEA has been in the news uh, of late in India because of uh, the retail thing, but uh, would just like to share some facts around how we have been in India so far. Uh, IKEA has been in India now for almost 26 years and we have been running a purchase operations, uh, buying close to $450 million of products. And there are approximately 400,000 people uh, who are employed by IKEA uh, through our suppliers and sub-suppliers. Uh, I would like to share an example about how we have used uh, the local ecosystems and uh, inclusive innovation to transform an industry. Uh, carpet production, as you know, is uh, very labor intensive, especially the handmade carpet production. And almost 50% of the cost of a carpet is actually from the wages uh, of the weaver. And with increasing uh, competition in the global market and with machine-made alternatives, uh, there has been over the years a lot of downward pressure on the cost of the carpets. And that has led to the weavers earning less and less, making it a very unprofitable and unsustainable profession for them. So in IKEA, we decided to transform uh, this situation. And the only way that uh, we could do it was through innovation. And the first step uh, that uh, we took was uh, to bring the carpet production into factories. So it moved the work, uh, which was like a subsistence f uh, weaving happening in the homes, uh, into an industry where there was work every day. And the weaver was also assured of uh, the social security benefits. And they also got the legal and fair wages uh, for the work that they were doing. So that was the first step. And having done that, uh, we uh, went into uh, innovation uh, where we introduced uh, a new loom, uh, which uh, we have developed uh, uh, through our uh, people in IKEA as well as uh, with our local partners. And this loom is actually uh, helping and creating a lot of benefits. In terms of uh, earlier, it used to take four days for a weaver to make a carpet. They can actually do it in two and a half days now. Uh, there were two weavers uh, who required to be working in a single machine. Uh, now we have one person uh, who can do it. And the biggest impact has been that uh, what used to require three months of training, in which there were a huge number of dropouts, now it takes just three days of an orientation to get them to weave uh, on these carpets. Then the looms uh, which have been there so far in the industry, uh, I mean for maybe uh, close to more than 100 years, was very much uh, made in the way that men could operate it. So this new loom is very easy for uh, women to operate. And that has had a huge impact in terms of getting a lot of more people uh, and women especially to come and work in the factories. And what was seen as traditionally a very low level of job is actually now being seen as uh, something which is uh, respectable. Uh, we have got good quality of the product. And also uh, the new loom is uh, highly ergonomic because of which uh, the health of the workers and their tiredness levels are much lower than what, e what it used to be before. 
So having, uh, having done this, uh, what, uh, what we are seeing is that uh, we have enabled a lot more people uh, to get involved in this uh, carpet profession. There are more women uh, who used to stay in their homes in the villages and they are now coming to the factories and they have a regular job. So we have actually helped in the skill development. Uh, we have provided people uh, with, a, with a training and a knowledge which helps them to earn a sustainable livelihood in their local places. At the same time, uh, through our IKEA Foundation, uh, we have opened a number of schools in these villages, which allows the children to get the education over there. So when all these uh, efforts are put together, we see that uh, we have supported to create a local ecosystem, uh, which is providing a better uh, everyday life uh, to the weaver. And uh, the customers love to buy the handmade carpets in the IKEA stores. And we also have the weavers who are really happy and earning a good living by making these uh, carpets. So this is uh, something which uh, we can share here as a good example, uh, which is a win-win situation because uh, we can sell more carpets. And also the people who make these uh, carpets in the villages and the weavers, they are also getting a fair, equitable wages and they have a better life uh, because of this. And this is what uh, we, we share as an example of uh, creating a better everyday life for the many people, uh, which is what the vision of uh, IKEA is. So this is what uh, we wanted to share from IKEA today. Thank you. Thanks, Kushal. So I think you can see uh, the innovation and the uh, design aspect of innovation that can make a huge difference to outcomes and and thereby inclusiveness. And I think there was another very interesting, uh, you know, technology use that I heard of the other day, which was really about training, even high-end skills like <coughs> welding, where, you know, some new tools have come in where you can just basically train a, 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 per, an art, a person just how to weld very, very accurately and effectively by getting them to follow instructions on a toolkit and, you know, as they, uh, you know, weld, unless it is done uh, properly, they don't get the right mark. So till they, you know, score 10 on 10, they are considered not yet fully trained. Now, this is very interesting, you know, use of technology to do training in, in a very, very precise way. And now I'd like to turn to Dr. Kristen Wood, who is... Um, the head of the engineering product development and co-director of SUTD MIT Design Center. And I'm sure this is something which everyone has heard of. And I would like to hand it over to you to tell us how you are looking at inclusive innovation using your MIT design approach. Great. Thank you very much. Madam Chairman, uh, esteemed panelists, uh, distinguished uh, colleagues, uh, it's, been, it's an honor to represent Singapore here uh, with my colleagues, Prof Ming Po, as well as you'll hear tomorrow from uh, Prof Ricardo Sosa. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about an initiative of Singapore, which is indeed our university. Uh, Singapore University of Technology and Design, or SUTD, uh, is founded really as the fourth national university two and a half years ago to really look at innovation and bring complementary to the wonderful universities that are there, a little bit of distinctiveness, a little bit of new approaches to think about innovation and to inspire risk-taking uh, in a country that's actually been risk-taking for since its founding and, and may perhaps do it in a little different way. Uh, to do this, I want to tell you a little bit about the International Design Center as an example of local ecosystems for inclusive innovation. And let's see if I can get this to work. Got it. A little bit about its structure. Uh, SUTD is formed uh, as a university, uh, not common uh, to most universities around the world. It has no departments. It has no schools. It has no colleges. Instead, the university is founded very much on what the world will need today uh, and what the world will need tomorrow in innovation, uh, and that is products, systems, services, and software. And really, that's how we've organized ourselves, and it's a very flat organization. Uh, within that, to really have a world-class university to begin with and affect innovation, uh, the decision was made to begin the International Design Center. Uh, this is a $100 million initiative between uh, SUTD and MIT, 
Uh, and what you see on the screen before you is a little bit about its structure. And I think the structure speaks to what we're attempting to do as a local ecosystem. It's arranged around first grand challenges. We are, there are three of those. As opposed to the EU grand challenges we saw earlier, which these are very complementary, we can't do them all at one university. So we've chosen three to focus on. Uh, first, that's sustainable built environment that has everything to do with cities. Cities not only which Singapore is, but cities in the region, cities in the world, urban planning, and also any, any large-scale systems that relate to sustainable built environment. And that can include healthcare, uh, transportation, et cetera. Another grand challenge which we've undertaken is design with the developing world. Uh, unique about Singapore is our partners are MIT, uh, the West, and Zhejiang University in the East. And we're bringing those together in Singapore because as you take one step out of Singapore, you're in an emerging market. You're in an opportunity with our partners to affect the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, and that's very much what we're about. And that grand challenge design with the developing world is very much directed at that. Our third grand challenge is ICT-enabled devices for better living. I think something that, would, that should be, is very passionate with uh, India, with its growth in the ICT market. But it's about using information, communications, technology, uh, and creating devices that help better living for any scale at any level. Those are our drivers in technology. But as was mentioned by Madam Chairperson, design is at the core of innovation. And so while we're working on these technologies, we likewise try to advance design. We've organized our advances in that way in design research thrusts. Uh, they include uh, six, uh, ranging from how do you actually experiment with designs? I think you mentioned proof of concepts when we started. Where do you make the right decisions in experimentation to consider where to go forward? It includes how do we create visualizations and prototypings very quickly so that we can make judgments about designs and move forward? How do we bring computing to bear, but in a design way? How do we make decisions for flexibility? I know as many policymakers in the room, we make decisions today that we know have to change tomorrow with information we do not know. And so how do we make those flexible decisions to really promote innovation and do that in, through a global collaboration? So this is our matrix. It's about design research thrusts. It's about grand challenges. And we view this as a feed forward and a feedback system. As we make advancements in actual innovations in technology and our grand challenges, they inform how we should do design, how we should advance methods, techniques, methodologies, and processes. But then as we advance design, it then, it then comes back and informs the innovation and that ecosystem. So those, that's our structure. You can see some acronyms up there, EPD, ESD, ISTD. Those are our pillars. And again, they're, they're oriented to services, products, software, and systems. Uh, to do this, it is, interna it is an international design center. We're, two, again, two and a half years old. We have leaders at both places, at MIT and SUTD, on each of our grand challenges uh, and each of our design research thrusts. And that is very important to carry the vision forward. And I would also say many projects start off uh, as projects, and they have a lot of potential. But when you, when, you, when you really want to implement them at scale, you need a larger group of minds and scholars together. And we've tried to form that with our structure. A little bit about scale, a little bit about numbers shown here. Uh, at SUT and MIT, we have over 80 to 90 faculty that are funded through the program. We have about 250 total personnel in the center across MIT and SUTD, which is a very large scale, a very large effort. Uh, just to give a little bit about where we're at, we have about 100 projects underway between a quarter and a half million dollars. Uh, we have over or approximately 400 publications in two and a half years. Well, that's just scholarly. That doesn't necessarily help the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, but you'll also see up here we have accolades and we have patents and other things that are being generated at a very fast rate from this ecosystem, which we think Singapore is very smart to, to set up. Uh, leveraging to us is very important, and this is just one metric, but in terms of grants, we've leveraged uh, about $20 million from industry, from government agencies, uh, and from other centers, uh, and working on things together rather than working in competition. Uh, our facilities, I invite you all to come visit us. Uh, we're looking for partners continuously. Maybe I'll skip the facilities a little bit, even though they show really some very inspiring aspects about our design and tell us a lot, of, tell a lot about us. 
And where I'd like to end with is maybe just some snapshots to capture your Im imagination of what our local ecosystem is doing. Uh, and these are just snapshots. So to capture imagination, imagine a city form lab led by our architectural faculty where you can take any city around the world eventually, but now many cities in this local region and be able to answer things like what is its urban metabolism? What are the, what are the pedestrian pathways around any region of, this, of the city? What are the natural emerging centers of the city that were never formed by the government? Asking those type of questions to advance cities of the future. Imagine, if you will, and I'll skip a couple here. Imagine, if you will, um, taking uh, places like bus stops uh, and the fact that cities of the future will be less about cars and more about getting people from point A to point B in a very sustainable way and taking bus stops in a region where you don't want to add energy into it and it's a very hot region in Singapore for example and changing the shape motivated by airfoils so that you can effectively reduce people's temperature by two degrees C just as they sit there just making that environment more comfortable as we move people from A to B. Maybe an innovation. Imagine, if you will, uh, being able to take very ideas very quickly, shown here, maybe a rubber ducky, uh, and uh, just any concept you can have in your mind, and creating a, a large-scale prototype in a day or two, where if you use current technology, it perhaps takes you weeks. Imagine, if you will, uh, that we're looking at uh, health centers around the world in uh, very poor parts of the world. And we want to add an autoclaving system, a, a sterilization system. So we're going to partner with an Indian company that makes pressure cookers, mo modify those pressure cookers, add some technology that's very important to them, and attempt to reduce infection rates at these clinics by 50%. Imagine, if you will, a new, chair, a new a, or at least a different wheelchair concept, which we call the leverage freedom chair, that mobility in wheelchairs becomes much different, built for the terrain of the environment of perhaps where people live, not of the developed world where it's smooth, smooth paved ways. Instead, imagine this being right now being manufactured in India. Imagine, if you will, a microfluidics project by a couple of our faculty where we want to be able to take a, ver a sample from a person in one of these clinics, very quickly isolate a cell with microfluidics and do this for pennies and being, being able to diagnose disease very quickly and imagine what the reverse innovation would be in the developed world. Well, Madam Chairman, I think I will end there. Hopefully I've captured a little bit of imagination, but that's a model at least of our local ecosystem in Singapore. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> and now I'm going to turn to Dirk Pilat, of, uh, who's the Deputy Director for Science, Technology, and Industry at OECD, and uh, ask him to talk about you know, how the OECD looks at innovation in terms of both funding and scaling. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. Um, I was here uh, last year and it was a privilege to be here. At that point in time, it's an even greater privilege to be back and to, uh, to join this, uh, this, this gathering again. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the work which we're doing at the OECD in this area, but it's a bit of a challenge to be surrounded by six people who all represent a region or a country and so what I'm trying to do is more to talk a little bit about some of the evidence which we are trying to gather at the OECD which is more about scaling and also where we see some new opportunities coming from. And, and the interesting thing what we, we try to do here is, is looking across countries on where actually new job growth has been coming from in recent years and, and this was data looking through the crisis. Uh, 14 OECD countries and we also were uh, very fortunate to have data for Brazil in this, uh, in this area. And the interesting thing is that we found that all the new jobs uh, had, that have been created come from young firms, from firms of less than five year old. Whereas all the job destruction which we have been seeing in many OECD countries and also worldwide have been coming from older firms, from inc incumbent firms. And I think this is something which we're not necessarily very familiar with. I mean, my, my presentation now seems to go a bit fast. Uh, but it's really to try and show that uh, a lot of that new firm startups are really much more important than we often make them out to be. Uh, so also new opportunities to try and create these new opportunities is extremely important. Uh, we also, I think what we're trying to do here is to change the debate a little bit from small 
to young. I mean, I think small firms are very important, and, uh, but also I think what's maybe even more important to, to get this regeneration, to get these new opportunities come into the, the, the economy, and that's why startups, that's why young firms matter so much. Uh, so what we're finding here is that actually older small firms are actually destroying jobs, whereas younger firms, that's where a lot of the new jobs are being created. Um, and I think that's an, 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 a challenge to, to think more about. Uh, just to look across countries, and, and what's interesting here is, is actually the first country uh, you see here completely on the left is, is Brazil, uh, where 70% of the new jobs actually have come from, from young firms. Uh, a lot of the, the jobs really coming there, but also from a lot of actually European countries where you wouldn't necessarily expect it, most of the job growth coming from these younger companies, which are sort of the, the generators of new opportunities in, 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 in the economy. Uh, now, I think the, the, the challenge which we see in many countries, however, is very much around scaling. And this has come up quite a lot already this morning. Uh, what we found uh, in, in, in many countries, the problem is that a lot of firms just, once they have entered into the economy, they don't grow. They stay, they stagnate at a very small scale, so you don't really get this sort of scaling of these opportunities in, in the economy. Uh, the big example, which we've always been looking at, which we still have, is that the United States is still the economy where firms come in relatively small, and they scale much uh, more over time. They grow a lot bigger than they were, were in, in earlier on. Whereas if you have a country like Italy, where uh, firms enter into the economy, actually at a very similar scale than the United States, but they stagnate at a very small scale. And the question is, where is this coming from? I think also if we're talking about inclusive innovation, inclusive growth, we need to see this scaling of these new opportunities. We need to see this scaling of, 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 of new ideas. And the question is, therefore, what are some of the barriers which, which, which affect this? Well, we've been trying to look at this, and I think there are a couple of things which we, we found. One is that, um, and this is actually also in response a little bit to a, a challenge which Professor Gupta raised to me earlier in this year and when he was in Paris, which is basically, do firms that innovate actually get more resources? Are these actually the, the firms which, which, which where, where money is flowing to? And what we found, again, very big difference across countries. Countries like Sweden and the United States, where money is actually flowing to firms that innovate and that are patenting. Whereas in other uh, OECD countries, uh, countries, even a couple of countries which we wouldn't expect this for, uh, the Netherlands, Denmark, Spain, Italy, uh, resources don't necessarily flow to the most innovative firms. And, and I think this, again, for inclusive innovation, for growth, this is what you need to see. You want resources, opportunities to be really supported by, by funding, by, 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 by resources that, that have to flow to them. Uh, well, we've been trying to look a little bit at some of the policies which, which affect this. And some of those, and, and I'm not necessarily talking very much on the local ecosystem. I'll come back to that in my last slide. I, I just wanted to say there are a couple of things which need to happen at the national level which need to happen at the national level to really ensure that these opportunities are really being caught also at the local level. And this is things like making sure that the financial system works, that there are actually resources available for some of these, for this scaling to happen. So that you have money like risk capital, that you have funds which basically allow this scaling to happen. But also things like bankruptcy legislation. We are focusing very often on entry. We are often focusing on oh, it needs to be easy to create a company. The big problems we see in many countries are not around entry of firms, they are around the growth mm. of firms and also about failure of firms. Mm. So if we can do more in that area to allow that experimentation of firms, to allow the experimentation with new ideas, with new business models, I think we will also see much more of this growth of these new opportunities which will, will, will hap can happen in many countries. Um, so just let me wrap up with a couple of conclusions. I don't want to take you to all the empirical work which has gone into this because there's a lot of work which I think is, 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 is behind it. I think there are three ideas and, 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 and issues which I wanted to, to raise with you. First is to allow for experimentation. And this is a word which I think isn't used enough in the innovation debate. To basically, a lot of innovation is about experimenting with new ideas which are risky, which are difficult, which often fail. But if you don't allow this to happen, if you don't allow that experimentation to happen, you will also not get the innovation. And, and, and I think there are a couple of things which are fairly straightforward, often uh, sort of more regular policies which we can do here, uh, looking at reducing barriers to entry, looking at the barriers to growth of firms, which are, are often there, site-specific regulations, which we see in many countries, and also barriers to the exit and failure of, of companies. But because what we see in many, many cases is that it's very hard to actually uh, fail a company and try again. So to, to make that easier will, will really help. 
the second thing I think which we also found in, in a lot of our work is that sometimes a lot of the policies which we currently have in place are biased against young firms. They are biased against innovative companies because they often, we still also in a lot of the policy making which we have going on in countries, we talk to the incumbent firms, we talk to the multinationals, we talk to the large firms, we don't talk to the young firms because basically, well, who do we talk to? And, and they're not as clearly uh, sort of organized in many cases. So to try and do that, to really uh, create more opportunities for younger firms, for new companies, for entrepreneurs to talk to policymakers, and to make sure that we have a level playing field, I think is extremely important. And then finally, if we do these things right, then I think we also create a lot more opportunities for specific policies at the local level, which are crucial, because I think this is where innovation happens. And I think the examples we're hearing here are all extremely good cases of trying to bring people together to network, to increase access to, to risk capital, to develop networks, to mentor entrepreneurs, to develop skills, because that, these are the things which are much better done at the local level than at the national level. So these are a couple of the things which we're finding in our work, and uh, I hope it's been helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. I think, I think you raised some very, very important uh, aspects of creating the right ecosystem which is really about the ease of starting companies and more importantly, as you very rightly said, having the right bankruptcy legislation that allows companies to shut shop as well and start the next company. And I think very often what we find in many parts of the world which are very risk averse, there is a stigma attached to failure and it's very, very difficult to close down companies that are not working. So I think what you've raised is very, very important in terms of the right ecosystem. Now may I uh, turn to uh, uh, Siju Kurvila, uh, who is a, you know, someone who has actually set up an incubator, a village incubator in Kerala, and we'd like to hear about your case. Uh -huh. Thank you. So um, thanks for the second afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be, um, be at this particular forum. And it's also great that a lot of uh, themes have a lot of resonance uh, be with respect to having a local ecosystem or leveraging open innovation models. And um, so broadly, what we do is an initiative called Startup Village. It's actually an incubator at its heart. Uh, it's a not-for-profit society. It goes back to the fact that we ended up being entrepreneurs soon after college, and we decided we want to you know, try and see whether we can get other kids also to do the same thing. So with that, let me just briefly take you through what we're doing it and why we are doing it. And uh, in that sense, the context is such that, um, so we had a conversation about various issues in India. And one of the conversations is that in the next decade, a lot of youngsters are going to get into the workforce. And as it is, India has not really done well in terms of employing the workforce as well. Uh, we can talk about the amount of formal training, informal training that's happening in the entrepreneurship sector, but it's still a first generation entrepreneur. It's still a mom and shop business. That's how it happens in India. And most importantly, we always uh, heard reports and everything which said that, hey, it's very difficult to do, do a, I mean, a, a business in India. If you look at any reports, the ranking of India stands really far. So um, given this particular context, and that's the basic context in which this uh, thing happens, if you really need to employ the next generation of youngsters from India, you need to have tons of um, incubators. If you just took a local, uh, global footprint, you know, India is around 65, US has 2,000, and, and China has around 1,000. And how do we really you know, scale the incubation infrastructure in India to actually cater to all these kinds of people? And with that, the other issue is the fact that most of these incubators in India were in public institutions. And some of them were really exceptionally working, but the rest of them were really lacking a lot of implementation strength, partly because of the fact that the private sector participation in India is quite low in academic institutions. And very importantly, there is a huge gap between the academy and what's happening in the industry. I, mean, I did my engineering in uh, one of the top colleges in the state. The only thing that kept me to the college was my attendance. And there's nothing exciting for me in the whole college, except the fact that I need to you know, go to college in the evening to play basketball. Everything else was just you know, full time pass. And that's what happens there. So um, the context is that uh, how do we really scale the incubation infrastructure in India? What is the roadmap to 1,000 incubators? And that's what Startup Village is an experiment. So Startup Village is actually India's first public-private partnership incubator. Um, government of India has partnered with us in DST, Department of Science and Technology. We are also partnered with the government of Kerala as well. So the broad structure is that <coughs> government, uh, the public entity, provides the infrastructure, some amount of grants, and the policies, and the private sector takes care of the vision and execution. And that's what uh, the, the core of the structure is all about. We are a not-for-profit society. Um, 
uh, Chris Gopal Krishna is the chief mentor. And at the heart of it, we have a huge focus on internet and telecom product startups. India has done well in the services space quite a bit. And we need to really start looking at a product startup culture. And that's the heart of what we try to do. And since we ended up doing uh, the startup as college kids, and globally, if you look at it, um, tons of youngsters are doing the uh, Googles and Faces of the world. So we looked and really looked at it and said that, why can't our youngsters also do the similar things as well? So at the core of our vision is to try to search for the billion dollar company from our college campuses. So if we guys could do it, anybody in college could actually do it. That's the, um, the spirit which drives our philosophy. It all started um, back in our college when we ended up doing our own startup in 2005. We were all first generation entrepreneurs. My dad is a government servant and all of us had this idolized notion of getting a good job and getting a, you know, doing education well and getting a good job. And we happened to get into this incubator called Technopark in Trivandrum, and that was our first exposure. And that's when someone actually mentored and guided us to these various concepts. And this particular was the initial starting point. That's a backdrop of the whole thing. And Technopark over the last five years had really seen, so when we started, we were the only company in Technopark. We were the only student startup. Not even our friends understood what our technology startup was. And from that point, Technopark over the last five years has seen 125 companies come out of it. So it's been quite a, uh, a difference in itself. And I came from the state of Kerala, which is traditionally not really known for entrepreneurship. We always used to produce amazing people who used to work in good companies, uh, but uh, we're not really known for entrepreneurial skills as well. So one of the impacts that we actually created, in the 80s, the ideal aspiration of a youngster graduated was to get into a government job. And in the 90s, around the time that I graduated, it actually moved to the infos of the world where I wanted to be in a, a software company. That's why I idealized an ocean. And at some way down the line, these aspirations have started changing. And Startup Village, one of the biggest things that we have been able to do is bring in a change about in this particular aspiration. And it's really kicked in a lot of imagination of the youngsters of our state as well. So what has happened, the youngsters are also a very different breed right now. The conversations about Generation Y, how do we connect with them? You know, they are much more global in their outlook. They are more open in their communication. They're quite different as well. And this has been a response from um, the community in the first 100 days. It's only been about a year since we started, 90 days, and we had received more than 100 applications. We had a lot of people expressing very much interest in us, which is a happy coincidence. So we have heard all these stories about serendipitous encounters happening in the valley where you, you know, end up meeting people you didn't expect. And these are some of the people which you know, popped up out of the blue. We had Sachin Pilot one day calling us and saying that um, he's going to come and check out what we guys are up to which was quite fascinating in itself. And after coming there, he actually drove around a small car using a mobile phone, which is quite interesting to see in itself. Uh, we had Sam Petroda come in, and he actually shared a story with the kids. Um, so Jennifer McIntyre, the US uh, Consul General, we had Canadian uh, Trade Commissioner visiting us. So all these things happened out of the blue. We had even people coming from the valley. So Esther Dyson, legendary angel investor, she actually came and said that if you need to do something, you should be allowed to fail. And when you have to fail, you need to fail in an environment like a startup village, where the impact of failure, the social stigma is failure, is not really that high. We had someone like um, Asha Jadeja coming in. She's, she's a Silicon Valley investor. So these are some of the ways in which we started. Uh, when we get to meet all these people in person, you know, these are people who only heard of fabulous stories about. That's when we also get energized and say that, hey, it's quite possible we can do it. Biggest thing, parents were quite dismissive to people doing entrepreneurship. Now parents also feel that in a startup village provides a safety net for kids to actually experiment. Uh, they're having a lot of wee-wee. We have been able to do a lot of difference in terms of changing the mindset from being a job seeker to a job creator. And this is just in the first one year. Um, so um, Kiran was the person who actually announced the uh, launch of Startup Village last year in uh, 2012. And he also alluded to the concept of giving university credits to students. So this is uh, an example of what we did. We worked with the government. And the government actually came up with this um, education policy. If you're in doing a startup with a government-recognized incubator, you actually get to bug 20% of your classes and get 4% you know, grace marks. Which is interesting because that will open the floodgates. It will be available to everyone. You're actually legitimately allowed to do something which you're interested in while not being an either or. Either you pursue your studies or you, you know, do your entrepreneurship. We faced that challenge when we were in college. So something interesting the government did. And this has created a lot of resonance in the crowd of students. So these are some of the initiatives happened there. We want to create a Coursera policy where kids are allowed to take university credits for taking a uh, course in Coursera. You know, we're trying to index to the what's happening in the world as well. So these are things which are on the way. And someone mentioned that if you're doing in, uh, innovation entrepreneurship, we have to do it on a scale. And that's why we started in a small building. Yes, we started in a water tank. Uh, typically, government programs start with a small building. But when we walked into a park, we saw a water tank building. We covered it up with some images. We made a makeshift space out of it. We created some bean bags, and that's why we started. Uh, it's complete makeshift space. It's still in a water tank. But seeing the good trends, the government has given us uh, this particular extension of a facility, it's a 100,000 square feet facility. Now with this, we'll be the largest in India. 
and possibly one of the top five incubators in the world as well. So we're really building to scale, and we're doing that. Um, we're also inviting private sector and public sector participation. So the Kerala State Electricity Board and BlackBerry came on board and set up innovation zones there. We need to start looking at leveraging all these tools of open innovation. For that, we need private participation. We need mentors and partners into the outside world as well. Um, our dear friend from Australia mentioned about um, internet connectivity. We wanted to power it with 1G connectivity. If you're building world-class ecosystem, you need to have world-class connectivity as well. And we powered this two days after Google opened the Kansas City 1G connectivity. And the 1G PBS connectivity which we had was actually a genuine innovation. As one of our startups who pieced together 150, you know, seven lines into uh, a 1G connectivity using his own proprietary technology. And that's how we did it. That's our only inauguration function. Uh, all this put together, the exposure part of it, we actually are doing an initiative called Startup Village Silicon Valley, where the bright entrepreneurs are given an exposure tour. You know, you have to actually see to believe it, right? When you actually see you know, someone like a, a Mark Zuckerberg or a, um, you know, Jack Dorsey say how we build a startup, that's when you start believing that, hey, possibly I can also try and do it. You know, all these guys are regular men. So that part is the accelerator program, and this exactly is what's really happened. When we started, we were the only company in Technopark. In the five years, you know, the numbers have spiked to 1,000. There's a number of applications we've seen in the last one year. We are still getting 100 to 200 applications every month. And this from a state where traditionally people said that not really, you know, people are not really looking at entrepreneurship. A large majority of them are youngsters who are still in college. Out of the 450 companies that we're supporting, 200 teams are student startup teams. So this is the uh, numbers which we have currently. And it's, it's a trend. It's a trend which was, you know, built over the last number of years. And if you really look at extrapolating this particular trend, and this is what we're building for in the future, we're actually seeing 10,000 startups coming out of it by 2020. Granted, it's a lot of experience early to experiment. It's an experiment in scale, and we really need to, uh, a lot of things to really make it work. Uh, the government of India uh, did take note of it. The planning commission um, did take note of it. They invited us after the recommendation from the National Innovation Council, fortunately. They could note of it, and we made a presentation about what it could impact. And they've actually come on board to create a 100,000, I mean, 500,000 square foot facility, which could potentially house all these people. You need infrastructure. You don't need swanky buildings, but at least you need a place to hang out and, you know, uh, do these kinds of things. The state government has responded by creating a 15-acre innovation zone. So you can't do it in silos. You need to have various clusters of, let's say, a biotech or a, a design studio, all these kinds of things in the same environment. You can't really fragment it. So that's what's happening here as well. Uh, the commitment of the state government is interesting right now. They've kept aside 1% of the government budget towards funding youth entrepreneurship initiatives in other sectors as well, which is quite interesting. You know, um, someone did mention that uh, the innovation budget has to go into the state budget itself. Uh, for the first time ever, a state celebrated an entrepreneurship day on the 12th of September, which is quite interesting itself. We wanted to call it a startup day, but startup was too much of uh, not really accepted the government, so we decided to go for entrepreneurship day. So September 12th is entrepreneurship day. So to conclude, uh, what we are doing is India's largest attempt at creating a blueprint of how do we scale the incubation infrastructure in India. And we're doing it at a scale. We're doing it at scale. Sometimes we're also quite scared and afraid of, but um, that's the only way to do it. And we really look forward to all your support and help. And um, at the heart of it, what we're trying to create is only a cultural shift. It's all about people. It's all about the community. And that's what we're trying to create at the end of the day. On that note, let me just sign off. I have one small video, which is a video that we created for the entrepreneurship day. So we heavily leverage um, online media and tools to reach the kids. They don't read newspapers anymore. Um, we just need to get them online. So I'll just uh, wrap up with that one bit of video. What we're trying to create is only a cultural shift. It's all about people, it's all about the community, and that's what we're trying to create at the end of the day. On that note, let me just sign off. I have one small video, which is a video that we created for that's the Entrepreneurship cool. Day. So we heavily leverage um, <laughs> online media and tools to reach the kids. They don't read newspapers anymore. So I'll just wrap up with that one bit of video. They're trying to fix the voice. What we're trying to create is only a cultural shift. It's all about people, it's all about the community. One man believed that India lives in its villages. One man believed that he could change the world. We believe in a new dream for a great future.
new journey. That's very exciting and uh, you know we wish you all the best. And now last but not least I'd like to call upon uh, Professor Michael Gregory who is at the Institute for Manufacturing at the University of Cambridge to share his views on this whole area of inclusive innovation. <coughs> well good afternoon everybody. Um, it's uh, great to be here in such a innovative environment. Um, I'd like to say a little bit about the evolution of the Cambridge phenomenon. It's a rather strange title, um, I suppose, uh, but I think it reflects uh, the, the Cambridge startup village, a rather different style, but a, a startup village. I always worry a bit about the name uh, phenomenon because when the consultant report that was written <clears throat> that applied that label, I don't think there was a Cambridge phenomenon, but it seems to have happened since. I'm, I don't think all innovation is driven by consultant reports, and there's real substance underneath it, I believe. This, of course, is a very bottom-up thing. Uh, many of us who end up as academics do so because we're unemployable. Uh, we don't uh, like being told what to do. And so the whole story of Cambridge is something bottom-up, uh, around which an infrastructure has developed. First of all, it's a cluster. Uh, you know all about clusters, uh, but I think we definitely identify these days uh, Cambridge as a cluster. We didn't know it was, but after some um, excellent academic work around the world, we now realize uh, we are a cluster. Um, and it's also known as the, the Technopole and also Silicon Fen because you've got to get silicon in there somewhere. Uh, I should explain that it's Fen because Cambridge is in a rather flat, boggy, windy bit of uh, England, and uh, one of the reasons it was successful for so long uh, as an academic institution, it's very hard to get to, uh, and people generally stayed away. Um, however, it's not just a few ivory towers. Well, I'm not sure they're ivory, more sort of uh, granity um, and gray looking. Um, but there are quite a few things that have come out of Cambridge that people aren't always aware of. Uh, the jet engine, Frank Whittle uh, was at Cambridge. Arm uh, processors, now you probably know, in